know, there's the whole pattern of the river. It's a branching system that looks just like the branching system on a tree. The branches gather together and form larger limbs, and then the larger limbs gather together and form the trunk of the river. Then overlaid on top of that, tiny rocky channels in the headwaters, undulating sinuous channels down in the lower reaches that are a whole bed form that suggests that in a way the river is like sort of a play of music on the landscape. And then they hit the B flat <laughs> throughout a whole reach of river system. You can take this wonderful, undulating, plunging, diverse piece of water and turn it into a single, solemn column of water that goes shooting down across the landscape. At one time, Manitoba's Dauphin Lake supported a productive winter fishery. In the early 1950s, the annual catch was over 200,000 pounds of valuable walleye alone. But then the catch fell and fell. By the mid-60s, the walleye catch was barely 10,000 pounds a year. Some said the lake was overfished, but others looked further. Despite a short growing season, the lake's watershed is a fertile agricultural plain. It's the old bottom of a glacial lake that once covered most of Manitoba. And Dauphin Lake is one of its smaller remnants. It's a landscape dominated on two sides by mountains that create their own weather. It's a mixed blessing. Basin residents enjoy substantially higher rainfall than other parts of the province. But they don't enjoy the floods that can result. In fact, flooding was so severe during the late 1940s that a major program of flood control was undertaken. Men and machines swarmed over the basin's rivers, cutting out meanders, deepening, channelizing. To the point that, like Edwards Creek, they weren't pretty, but they were functional. Too functional. After a heavy rainstorm in the Rocky Mountains, the floodwaters pour off the escarpment onto the farmland. Until 1991, John Toll was Provincial Water Resources Manager for the Dauphin Basin. In meandering rivers, the energy that the water has is dissipated every time it takes a bend. When you have straightened channels, um, the water has no way of discharging its energy. And what it does then is uses the energy by picking up the soil particles or eroding the banks and the channel bottom. And carrying it downstream into Dauphin Lake. So much soil, about 500,000 tons a year is the estimate, the lake's bottom was cloaked with as much as a meter of sediment. And Edwards Creek literally grew a delta in just three decades. The new floodways were conduits for erosion. Erosion is not only a concern where rivers have been straightened and channelized for flood control. It can be a problem with any development that removes the vegetation cover that normally keeps it in check. For example, here in New Brunswick, potato fields can lose as much as 20 tons per hectare or more of topsoil to water erosion every year. Where does that soil go? Where the water carries it into rivers and lakes, undermining agriculture and fisheries, like Dauphin Lake. 
In extreme cases, erosion can leave lakes and rivers so filled with fine particles of floating soil, turbid is the technical term, that fish gills clog up and aquatic plants die from lack of light. But damage to fish populations can happen long before conditions become this severe. Many of the most commercially valuable fish species require beds of rock and gravel in lakes and rivers to lay their eggs. Cover these beds in sediment or remove them completely and this most critical stage is disrupted. You know, they don't put obstructions in the floodway because that obstructs or causes some additional roughness in the channel, so it's less efficient for conducting water, and therefore you'd have to excavate a bigger channel to get the same flow down it. Bigger channel equals more bucks, bigger project. So as it goes over the top... A of civil the engineer yeah, by training, Bob Newbury is no stranger to the, the economics of designing now, water projects. So you try to design for the optimal channel shape, the minimum amount of excavation that will conduct the water. Unfortunately, fish don't like this. <laughs> they don't like this shooting flow that goes bashing down the channel. What they want is the kind of hydraulic diversity that occurs in the ripple zone. If I introduce just these pool and ripple obstructions in here, I take when water meets an obstruction, it first backs up here, to form a pool, it, then cascades or ripples across to flow on until it meets another obstruction. In a natural river, these meandering pool and ripple sequences not only moderate erosion, they provide different habitats for fish to feed, rest, and spawn in. Those functions are often sacrificed to economics. And that's most of what happened at Dauphin Lake. In stream after stream, the spawning beds the fishery depended on were traded away for flood protection. Now these fish are pretty adaptable, so they got more dense in some streams, or they didn't really start to affect their reproduction success until we got the last few streams. Then when we channelized those, suddenly there were rapid declines in the fisheries population. In other words, we used up our, our cushion, if you want, of natural sites. So now it's critical that we go back and redesign and use both purposes, both flood control or irrigation or whatever, and fish spawning habitat in, as factors in the design. The Mick River here was channelized back in the 1940s, early 50s primarily for agricultural drainage. And we're going in now... Mark Gabbery is a fish biologist by trade and a stream doctor by practice. For several years now, he's been working with Bob Newbury and John Toll to put back what flood protection took away. Well, what we've done here is reintroduce pools and rapids into the stream course that was channelized and tried to recreate conditions that were, would be conducive to fish that would be utilized. But to do that, you don't just dump rocks in the middle of a floodway. You have to think like an engineer, but be able to hear a river's music. And that's where Dr. Bob, as he's often called, comes in. He's one of those people who not only can, he teaches as well. Well, what stage are you guys up to now? Well, we're just on our last cross section. Okay. We're just about done here. And so what he teaches is that nature path. is its own best model. And even at this late stage in research and development of water resources, there's not a good understanding of what the actual hydraulics and characteristics of a spawning site are. So what we've got here is a site that we know there are seven or eight hundred walleye each year that come into these small riffles and rapids and spawn here. And the students are measuring the hydraulics and the velocities of the flow and the hydraulic conditions of the flow to see what the walleye are responding to. It's all grist for the mill, if you like. Jim, you move to the left a bit? 
raw data that can be turned into equations describing this small part of the symphony. 277. And armed with those, now you can dump your rocks in the floodway. But not just anywhere if you want to provide the kinds of habitat conditions that we would normally see in a natural stream. So we've positioned a lot of these rapid zones in the same kind of frequency, the same distance apart that they would normally occur in a stream of this size. And what that does is to create the pools, the string section to the woodwinds of the riffles that walleye also need for spawning. And the pool is a, usually has a depth of about a meter, and the walleye can, can uh, sit in this pool and, and rest in this pool during the daylight. And, and uh, like many fish, evening, it's when darkness falls that they get the urge, if the music's right. The eggs are broadcast, fertilized in the pool upstream of the rapids. They drift downstream into the rapid zones, and lie in between and among the rocks. Where the fast flowing water keeps the eggs oxygenated and sediment free. 10 to 20 days later, the eggs hatch and the young walleye start drifting down to the lake. At least that's the theory. And that's where Mark Gabbery comes back in. Every spring, he returns to these artificial riffles to suck eggs and count them. The uh, walleye eggs are here. They, you identify the walleye eggs by the oil globule at the top of the egg. And what we can examine when we look at these is the survival of the eggs by looking at ones that are alive, which are these ones, and the ones that are dead, which are the white speck eggs or white areas internally to, to the eggs, which are... And the count is good news. Dead. Walleye are not only spawning on these structures, egg densities and survival rates to hatching are comparable to natural riffles. And there's even some evidence that the way these structures step the water down across the landscape is helping to control channel erosion. Couple that with good management of the fish stocks and... In the long term, I think it's, it's a good sign for, for Lake Dauphin. Encouraging as those results are, stream rehabilitation is not enough. We tend to think of a river as the water between two banks. But the banks are really just the formal boundary. In fact, a river extends to the edges of its watershed, where it's admittedly a little drier, but no less a part of the symphony. Get some dust flying up behind. So how long have you worked with, with Dave? For Kendall Heisey and Jeff Teeley, it's another day, another farmer. Both are specialists in soil conservation. Kendall's with Manitoba Agriculture, and Jeff's with PFRA, the Prairie Farm Rehabilitation Administration. They're working together under a joint federal-provincial program called Farming for Tomorrow. So when was this waterway originally fixed up? A couple years ago, we tried to grass this, tried to grass it down, and it just didn't hold with all the all the rains that we had. We couldn't get the grass established. So this year, finally, we thought we better haul some rocks in. You can see right here we, on the edge, we have about a foot of topsoil loss, and uh, right where we're standing in the middle. It's probably about three feet lost here. And the actual, it's that kind of topsoil loss. The, the rock start there is where the erosion started and it backed up all the way. And the, the subsequent degradation of fish habitat so that programs loss. like Farming for Tomorrow try to so prevent by grassing down or otherwise stabilizing the waterways that drain fields. About this, this waterway anymore. But that's just the first step. To farmers, good topsoil is like money in the bank. Keep it there and it'll grow. Bumper crops. But it's a future that's blowing in the wind and flowing in the stream. High-tech, high-cost agriculture drives many to farm in ways that shortchange their land. Today's profit at tomorrow's expense. Not just for the farmer, but for Canadian society. 
And that's where Jeff and Kendall come in. Working with area farmers like Dave Yakamishan is the largest part of their job. And we're standing right in here. Since then, it's changed.